The Orchidaceae, a truly uh, fascinating family with um, some really unique uh, morphological and um, uh, other characteristics that uh, make it uh, of great interest to many, many people. These are monocots, so we're going to have parallel leaf veins and flower parts divided in three. These are very widely distributed, but um, uh, primarily in the tropics. About half of them are epiphytes, which means they grow on tree trunks. Um, for support, they don't hurt the tree, they just use it to get closer to the sun. Some of them, however, are uh, actually parasitic with no chlorophyll. Some are um, slightly parasitic, hemiparasitic. Flowers are usually showy. Um, they're bilaterally symmetrical, which means you can split them down the middle and they'll uh, be mere images of each other. And uh, they have a unique characteristic of being resupinate, which means as they start, as, they, as the flower matures, it rotates 180 degrees on its uh, stem. So what starts out as the top lip of the flower uh, becomes the bottom lip. Uh, they're exceedingly small seeds, up to a million in a, a small capsule, uh, which um, due to that uh, tininess of the seed, which has very little nutrient for support of the, new, um, of the germinating plant, they form a mycorrhizal association. Um, they have to form a mycorrhizal association in order to germinate and uh, establish. There are some uh, economically important species, vanilla in particular, but uh, also um, the floral industry um, has a huge uh, interest in um, uh, orchids that are sold for um, uh, corsages and bouquets and as uh, living plants. Key characteristics, uh, this family does have some uh, unique um, uh, structures. Uh, they form a protocorm, which I'll uh, show a slide of those in a couple minutes here, um, that uh, involves the mycorrhizal formation and uh, support of the young seedling. Um, they have uh, the, the uh, male and female uh, structures, the stamens and pistil, are fused into one structure called a column. They, uh, I already mentioned, have an enormous number of seeds per fruit, for, per fruit literally millions. The resupinate flowers that rotate 180 degrees during uh, development, uh, so seeing a twist in the stem below the flower is uh, uh, one way to know you're no looking at an orchid. And uh, the pollen is bound in little sticky packets called pollinia uh, that are uh, also quite unique to this family. Taxonomy, the, we're in the Asparagales, uh, where we, which is also where we saw the uh, Iridaceae. Um, this is an enormous family. There's debate amongst uh, the botanists whether there's a, a more in the Asteraceae or the Orchidaceae. Uh, for sure, there's over 20,000 species and probably um, some undiscovered. We do think, know for sure that there's twice as many orchids as birds species. Uh, there's four times the number of mammal species. And the number of orchids uh, in the world comprises uh, almost 10% of all plant species. Take that into account that there's also then um, another 100,000 <coughs> or more uh, horticultural uh, hybrids and uh, selections, and uh, there's a lot of orchids out there. We're on the monocot branch of our um, ep plant evolutionary tree over on the left side with the um, Amerasparagales, uh, a pretty ancient family, <coughs> uh, uh, sort of in the same um, boat as uh, Magnolia. Beautiful piece of orchid art, uh, Ernest Takel. Um, drew this uh, many, many years ago with many different types of uh, horticultural orchids featured. The protocorm, uh, this funny little um, small um, plant-like thing uh, that forms when the um, uh, seed is germinated um, is uh, essential for life of the young plant in natural conditions. Uh, now that there's so much interest in these uh, plants so horticulturally that there's um, uh, many, many, many different ways they're grown on agar, with the, the agar providing nutrients or the agar providing actual uh, fungi for them. In the lower right, you can see um, seeds that were germinated on um, uh, seven different types of fungi, and uh, they were no, uh, not successful on all but the one in the lower right, uh, where um, their protocorms did manage to develop. On the upper left, you can see the mycorrhizal fungi inside. Uh, this is a cross-section of a protocorm, so you can see um, the fungi inside the cells uh, along with the plant uh, nuclei. These plants do sometimes become non-mycorrhizal once they mature, but they need uh, support to get through that uh, first stage of growth. Additionally, they have pollinia. 
You can see a little bitty one on somebody's finger. Uh, a lot of people um, hand pollinate uh, orchids, and so um, uh, it's not too uncommon for people to be using tweezers to um, pull those off and put them on another plant they're trying to cross. Uh, you can see a dangly one here in the lower right um, on a plant hoping to uh, attract an insect. And on the left are two insects that uh, have been uh, successfully uh, into a flower and had the uh, pollinia transferred to their heads that will then be deposited on the next flower that they visit. Uh, orchids are pretty good at tricking insects into uh, thinking that they're going to um, uh, have a, a female wasp uh, that <coughs> is uh, putting out pheromones uh, in an effort to attract the male, uh, when in, in reality it is uh, the plant, the orchid, uh, has able to grow a structure that uh, resembles a female wasp, to at least to the male wasp. And additionally, with the false scent, um, uh, the male is tricked into struggling around in the flower long enough to get its um, pollinia onto its forehead and then uh, go off to another flower to have the same experience. This is called uh, pseudocopulation. And uh, it's thought that uh, up to a third of the world's orchids uh, do this. Here is another one called the hammer orchid. It's also from Australia. Let's see if we can get it to play here. on a particular group of wasps known as the tinnids. In the spring, a female tinnid emerges from the sandy soil where she's been feeding on beetle grubs. She's now ready to mate. If you burrow, it's difficult to develop wings and she has none, so she can't travel far. But the males can, for they feed by hunting and do have wings. They will have to come to her. Once settled, she begins to emit a message of perfume that is detectable for a long distance downwind. Then she waits, and usually not for long. The male carries her away and will mate with her in midair. This, however, is plainly not to our eyes a wingless female wasp, it's a tiny orchid. But it does carry the signals which indicate female wasp to a male wasp. And not only that, it backs those visual signals with a perfume that is virtually identical chemically to the smell emitted by a female wasp. And the two things between them are quite enough to delude a poor male. Watch. He tries to fly away with her. But how is this helping the orchid? The answer lies in the ingenious mechanical construction of the flower. The purple part is the bogus female. The other half carries a little cup with the pollinia attached to another of those sticky pads. A black head and a furry body is all apparently you need to disguise yourself as a female. This simplified mock-up is attached to the other part of the flower by a delicate but strong hinge. When the male tries to carry off what he assumes is the female, he is thrown upwards by the force of his own exertions towards the cup and the pollinia. But the male's position has to be absolutely correct. In spite of the enthusiasm with which this one is trying to mate, he isn't clinging in exactly the right way. Perhaps this time the orchid will be luckier. Obviously there's little wrong with this orchid's mimicry. Two males are trying to get at it. There, the 
pollinia are attached to his back. So, you can see um, hammer orchid, uh, well named and uh, well constructed as far as orchids are concerned. Continuing the same theme, it turns out that uh, the name Orcus uh, was Greek for testicles. And when Theophrastus, who is uh, considered the father of botany, uh, got around to naming orchids, uh, he thought the structures uh, of their tubers uh, were appropriate enough that uh, the orchids uh, got the name orchid. Vanilla, uh, extremely important uh, worldwide, um, uh, very popular seasoning uh, used in all sorts of sweets and <coughs> chocolate and uh, many, many, many different recipes. Uh, these are huge woody vines uh, called lianas uh, that grow where it's uh, really quite hot and, uh, and importantly, uh, humid all the time. Uh, they try to get up into the um, uh, canopy of the trees so they can get up to 80 feet long, but when they're cultivated, uh, there's a lot of hand labor involved in uh, turning them downward so that uh, they can be reached by hand. It's a very labor-intensive industry. Um, forms an um, uh, important part of the um, economy in Indonesia and Madagascar and uh, quite a bit of China. Uh, produces uh, vanilla. You can see the structure of vanillin, uh, which is uh, one of the secondary metabolites that's uh, primarily responsible for the flavor of vanilla. But of course, there are many other uh, uh, smaller, um, uh, smaller in um, importance um, compounds that are involved in the um, actual flavor. There is an artificial one that's made, but uh, those uh, who uh, have tasted it can usually tell that it's just not quite the same. Flower is quite attractive, and uh, you can see some uh, green, uh, un unpicked, unripe beans on the right, and then the vanilla beans on the left. Uh, vanilla is produced by uh, soaking these beans in various solutions, uh, usually an alcohol extract, uh, to get the flavor out. Uh, the moth orchid, Phalaenopsis, uh, many, many different species and cultivars, is uh, become an enormous industry, uh, especially in Taiwan. Uh, Southwest Taiwan, there are uh, numerous uh, huge greenhouses that are um, highly industrialized. Everything on tracks and rollers and uh, picked up and moved around. Um, they much of the reproduction is um, done through tissue culture. Uh, historically, uh, there were a lot of hobbyists that uh, were very um, passionate about uh, growing orchids and uh, the problem was they grew so slowly that uh, it was difficult to um, uh, mass produce them. And once it transitioned uh, to an industry with uh, tissue culture, um, the, the um, production and shipping of orchids has uh, become uh, hugely important. Some parasitic orchids. Uh, here's one that uh, I took a picture of in Glacier National Park. It's called striped coral root. You can see the little plenia on the left. Uh, when I took the picture, I didn't realize that's what those were. And on the right, you can see the whole, whole plant. And uh, it is indeed parasitic, no chlorophyll. Um, it's getting um, nutrients uh, f through a fungus. And the fungus is taking them off of um, a nearby plant, uh, usually uh, different pine trees. So um, uh, mycorrhizal symbiosis for the pine tree, but a little bit of carbohydrate leaking out the system into uh, the coral roots. There's another coral root that uh, Robert Frost wrote a poem about. I won't uh, narrate the whole poem to you, but if you want to look up on Going Unnoticed, um, it's an interesting little commentary about, I think, uh, the futility of man or something or other. But um, uh, the coral root, uh, this coral root is the focus of the poem. Ladies' dresses. Uh, there's several different types of ladies' dresses. Uh, there's uh, six or seven of them that are uh, native uh, to Iowa. This one is nodding ladies' dresses, which I think is probably the most common one, Spiranthes cernua. has a real uh, unique flavor, uh, really kind of similar to vanilla, that uh, when you're walking near it, um, uh, a lot of people can smell it before they find it. Native, uh, pretty widespread in the U.S. Uh, this map is is uh, a U.S. only map. Uh, the, the plants do not know geographic boundaries, and uh, they do indeed incur uh, quite a bit in Canada. Here's another uh, uh, common type of, uh, of orchid in the U.S. Uh, called a lady slipper. There's uh, uh, Cypripedium. Uh, there's many different uh, species in this genus. 
Uh, this one is uh, Cypripedia montanum, or uh, mountain lady slipper, which is native uh, to the Rockies in the west. Uh, this one, again, uh, taken at uh, Glacier National Park, where they grow quite widely. Uh, another uh, Iowa native uh, orchid is um, Western Fringe Prairie Orchid. Uh, we also have Eastern. Uh, both are extremely rare, and people are very happy when they find them. Uh, they have been found at Chichaco Bottoms. Another Iowa native, uh, small and not very um, uh, showy, uh, is the Purple Tway Blade. It's um, a sort of an understory little plant. Uh, you could just about uh, walk past it and never notice it. It's uh, pretty common, though, in the eastern uh, parts of uh, Iowa. Toxicity of the Orchidaceae, not much. Uh, pretty much everything says not toxic. There are a few medicinal uses, but even for that, uh, for considering how many plants uh, species there are, uh, there are uh, very little uh, usage as far as uh, medicinals. And finally, for more information, there's uh, the usual um, uh, suspects and a couple fan sites that have uh, picture after picture after picture of just uh, beautiful flowers. And uh, you can always go to the Orchid Red uh, Festival in Redland. Uh, this year it's in May. That concludes the Orchidaceae.